Cody, um, you have such a fascinating background and, um, you started out as a journalist and then you went into VC investing and you've spent a lot of time in the cannabis space and now you're into acquisitions. So walk us through a little bit about your background. How did you end up here kind of where you're at and all the way through to acquisitions? Sure. Yeah. Well, we were just talking about you spending a lot of time in El Paso. So um, when I was uh, a journalist, I was a conflict journalist along the U.S.-Mexico border. I was actually in Juarez quite a bit. So right across from El Paso writing about, you know, some real human atrocities, right? Um, and, uh, and at the time, um, I was young and I was a little bit naive. So I thought we were gonna change the world. I'm like, when people know about this, you know, everything's gonna change. And, uh, and of course, like Britney Spears shaves her head, like nobody cares. And so, you know, I have my little quarter life crisis. And, um, and at the time I'm like trying to conceptualize, um, you know, what does it mean to actually create change? What's, what's the best way to do it? And the only thing that I could see different from la my last name Sanchez and the other people's last name Sanchez who were right by me was that, you know, I had different socioeconomics than they did, right? Like I grew up in the US in a middle-class family and they grew up um, with, you know, not access to middle-class resources in the US. And so that got me kind of excited to understand money and this green currency. So I climbed through finance and did, you know, Goldman Sachs and alternatives and private equity and investment banking and all the things you do when you work on Wall Street. And, um, and finally got into building my first business in partnership with a large firm uh, that was a Latin American investment and distribution business, raised a couple billion dollars, exited that business. And when I got out of that business, I uh, was looking for sort of the next thing. And all throughout, you know, probably for like the last 10 years, I've invested in startups and I've acquired small businesses one off. You just, you kind of learn how to do that when you do private equity and, and venture capital. And so I would always do what we call club deals um, in investment land, which is like us partners would invest in deals. But the, um, the interesting part was at that time, I realized like I was always looking for arbitrage opportunities. So where does, where's there a common narrative that doesn't fit the truth? And so I found that in Latin America, it was an emerging market. The arbitrage opportunity was other people weren't as knowledgeable on the space as I was when you put into the fact that I was American, could handle fin American financial markets in Latin America. Then cannabis, the stigma was keeping all the big players out. So I thought we could play in that space. So I'm a partner at a PE firm in the cannabis space now. And then in, in finance, they have this funny saying, which is um, get rich quietly. I remember my last CEO, that's what he used to say. I like to get rich quietly. And I understand why there's a lot of negative things that come with being public, but that just didn't seem that good to me. It kind of seemed like we should, you know, get rich together. Um, and, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'm going to start sharing the things that I've learned. And so I started a blog in January and that blog grew to about a hundred thousand subscribers. And it's a newsletter that kind of gets sent out about thinking critically and cash flowing unconventionally. And I shared my ideas. And then I'm sure similar to you, Ryan, I got asked a ton by a ton of people, like, how do you make these happen? How do you buy businesses? How do you sell businesses? So I got a little tired of answering that question. I can be a little uh, impatient. And so we wrote a course about it and have a mastermind on it and wrapped a business around sort of those ideas. And that brings us to today. Oh, I love it. That's such a fascinating background. There's a lot to un unpack there. And especially that if you were roaming around the streets in Juarez, uh, 10 years ago, it was pretty dangerous. There were, there were months where they, for people don't know, 10, 12 years ago, there were months where they would have, you know, 10,000 murders in a month. It was actually considered more dangerous than Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but like you said, Britney Spears shaves her head and nobody cares. So that's just yep. welcome to the media that we have today. And, you know, it's not like it's gotten any better 10 years later. So, um, yeah, so fascinating. you come from this private equity background. You built this really fascinating career, Cody, of identifying opportunities that are, you know, you know, in hindsight, look, look really obvious, but you know, either people are scared to go in that space or they just don't have enough uh, background to feel comfortable going in that space. And one of the things that I've loved always about your newsletter, and you know, that's actually kind of how we reached out to you and how we connected was um, you, you are about, Hey, let's get rich together. There's this, isn't this fine amount of success that people can have. We can all do this together. Um, now my background is more in, um, I kind of stumbled upon how to buy companies and just made a bunch of mistakes in that process. Now you come from a private equity background. And so you kind of have this professional training on how to do this. Can you walk us through some, you know, one or two of your early acquisitions or any one that you uh, either did something perfectly right or did something perfectly wrong? Can you walk us through one or two of those? 
Yeah, sure. Well, the first business that I ever, I started a business because I had a need. So I did the startup thing first. It was called Threads Refined. It was like a marketplace of uh, financial style or financial stylists, fashion stylists, because I really hate buying clothes. I hate getting dressed. I hate the whole thing. I would wear like Lululemon if I could all day. Um, but, uh, but I started that business and, um, and then I acquired a business to, um, optimize our growth. So I basically acquired sort of a digital market marketing agency to put behind threads refined to the actual business. So that was my first acquisition. The acquisition was actually fine. The problem was I hated running that business. I hated it. I didn't like fashion stylists. I didn't like influencers. Like they say, make a business out of your pain. Like I don't really agree with that typically. <laughs> and so I think you can you can buy a business you're not that excited about and have cash flow and revenues and an operator in it, but you shouldn't start one and then have to be the operator in it. So the, I think the biggest mistake with that deal was I, um, I, I did it in a space that I required a ton of my attention. I didn't even know at the time to think about an operator. And when I bought my first business, I wasn't thinking like a private equity or venture capital person does. I was thinking like an entrepreneur does, right? I was like in there trying to fix all of it. So I think the biggest mistake I did in that business, and, and we sold it, but not for a huge multiple, was, um, was trying to do it all myself and instead uh, and being a little greedy instead of how could I get an operator in, in here that would love this business and would love running it? And how can I have it make enough cash flow to where we can pay off them and I can just take a dividend on it? And instead of doing that, I sold it for not a very good multiple and it was a profitable business. So I should have just held the business and put an operator in there. And that was probably my biggest first mistake in a business. Uh, that's, that's so interesting because I think a lot of people, when they get into entrepreneurship or they get into starting a business, they say, I need to learn how to do everything. Well, let me break it to you. You're not going to be very good at SEO and writing and selling and hiring and firing. Like you just can't do it all. So um, can you can you dive into a little bit when you said rather than thinking like an entrepreneur, you were kind of like alleging to like thinking more like an investor or private equity firm. How have you been able to do that? And how do you approach deals that way? Yeah, well, now it's totally different. Like a lot of people in our mastermind, for instance, somebody was saying today, um, which sectors can I get financing on enough with an SBA loan or with another loan in order to buy? And I was like, wrong question, but because that's actually not the most important thing. The most important thing is, is it a profitable business? You're looking at it like an asset, right? That's the difference when you're an investor versus an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur, you're like, what's the problem I want to fix in the world? What's the solution I think we should have? When you're an investor, you're like, what are the, show me the money, right? Like, what are the numbers? So, you know, for me, it was, okay, Say I want to make $100,000 on a business. I want to replace my W-2 wage and I want to go out and start a business. Then what I'm looking for is not a jewelry making business because that's my passion. I'm not looking for like a jobby. I'm looking for something that actually gives me 100K in the door. So that is, I think, the biggest difference is we as investors, we don't really, you know, I don't buy bonds because I love the underlying company that the bond comes from, right? I'm like, that doesn't even matter. I buy a bond because it has the right return profile and risk profile that I want. And I think in the, in the same thing with a house, like when you're buying in, in a house to invest in, are you ever like, ooh, like I could picture myself in here in the living room? You're like, no, no, no. Does it fit the right metrics? Is it going to have the right risk and return on it? And if it does, then I'll buy it and then I'll cash flow on it. And I think in the future, businesses will be more like that. And instead of me, yeah, I don't love, um, I own a podcast production company, for instance, Strike Fire Productions. And I really, I don't know anything about audio engineering. I don't know anything about the business overall, uh, but I got into that business because it was making about $120,000 in profit. And the guy was walking away from it. He didn't want the business. And so, you know, when I came in, I, I invested in that business $10,000 and now own 40% of it because I optimized the processes behind that business. And, uh, and, and now I have a great operator in there, Jonathan Small, who runs it. And so um, that is the main difference is you take the passion out of it and you think like an investor about the profit and then you get passionate about making that profit or you get passionate about growing the business or you get passionate about marketing some aspect of the business, but it doesn't have to be the overall business that you're obsessed with. That's, that's super interesting. I appreciate diving into that. And the fact that you can 
um, you know, like your example of taking over a particular business that someone is just going to walk away from, they were burnt out and for 10 K optimizing it and putting the right GM in there, you end up at 40% of the business, which, you know, is a win, win, win for everybody. You know, no one out there is going to say, Oh, you ripped him off. Well, he was just going to walk away from it. And I think what's really important when you think about buying a business, it is an asset. And so it's, it's maybe a, it's a different type of asset than say stocks, bonds, buying real estate or whatever it might be, but it is an asset. And when you approach it that way, I think you're thinking about it perfectly in that, Hey, I don't necessarily care what it's in, but I'm passionate about growing the business. I'm passionate about uh, my lifestyle. Right. And if your lifestyle is X, then it funnels back into, well, your business will fund your lifestyle. I've always been to the belief, Cody, that we're in business to live, not like our businesses should run our life. Um, when it, when it comes to, so you see a lot in the space and you have, have been a part of really large acquisitions, really large investments all the way down to small ones, right? Um, what are the biggest opportunities you see in, in the marketplace? Is it, you know, certain online companies? Is it a lot of the local service brick and mortar type businesses? Where do you see some of the big, biggest opportunities just kind of across the space? Yeah. I, you know, um, one, I think the biggest opportunity totally depends on who you are. This is the annoying part about buying businesses is you could say in real estate, oh, it's the single family market in Austin six months ago. And, you know, you would have, that would have been the place to be, right? Um, and anybody could buy it and anybody can do something with it. But what I found is that it really depends on who's going to buy the business. And so, um, you know, for you, Ryan, the most interesting business is probably something that's accretive or adds value to the other businesses that you do, right? And so, and then for, for me, it's probably the same thing. It's probably some sort of media business that already does things for my other business or a cannabis business that does things for my other business. So, um, but, but the best deals, like the cheapest businesses, in my opinion, are of hundred percent, the service-based brick and mortar businesses. And, and quite honestly, I mean, I helped this, one of our UA members, Brittany, she owns a gym and I guess it's not a gym. Yeah, it's a gym. It's like a, it's like one of those women focused workout gyms. Like they have classes only. It's cool. It's got like pink everywhere. Oh yeah. I've, um, seen before. I've never been to one. Cause I'm not allowed. <laughs> yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. So she, she owns this, you know, it's called Brit by Grit. And, um, anyway, and she was talking to me about all of her girlfriends that are other gym owners, Pilates owners, yoga studios, whatever going out of business, right. All over the place. And she was like, it's really sad. So I bought some equipment from them. Da, da, da. I'm like, hold up, hold the phone. I'm like, did they sell their business? She's like, no, no, Cody, they went bankrupt. Like keep up, you know? And I'm like, no, 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 you keep up. Wait a second. I'm like, this is a huge opportunity because every time a business owner goes out of business and just goes like this to it, which is what the podcast production guy was going to do, they're losing massive value because if nothing else, you have an email list of subscribers, right? Worth something. If nothing else, you have employees or aqua hires for somebody else. If nothing else, you potentially even have recurring revenue that you're giving up or current revenue that you're giving up. It's just not enough to offset what you have at this moment. So there's, there's this opportunity, I think, that's huge with businesses that have just gone under or businesses that are about to go under. And so what I walked through with her was a template to reach out to all of these owners who had gone under or were about to and say like, hey, I really feel for you. I want to do something to give you sort of an annuity, some cash flow continuously after your business sort of, you know, has, has had its last days. So what I'd love to do is why don't we do an affiliate deal or a revenue share deal where I essentially buy your business through revenue and you can email all of your customers tell them to come over to our store. We can host a couple of classes with you there. And all of the clients that come over to us on a monthly subscription basis, will pay you out over 12 to 18 months on it. And we'll do the same thing with all of your instructors. And so just like that, she's able to pick up another 200, $300,000 in revenue off of four businesses that have gone under and, and essentially buy them, uh, but only using a revenue share. So if I was listening to this out there, that's what I'd be trying to do in any brick and mortar. And, and for any listeners who aren't understanding what just happened, when you acquire something that um, as, uh, as, as a, like, you know, Hey, we're going to pay you 20% of revenue for the next 18 months. It literally means no money down, right? Cause they're going to go out of business. And so you're, what you're, what you're establishing is 
Hey, you're going to walk away from nothing. Hey, if you just do two more weeks worth of work and send all your clients to us, we potentially can pay you X amount over whatever the time period is. And a lot of times it's not very long. So even if you were to buy a company at, you know, one and a half X annual profit, which would be 18 months, it's like a steal, right? But in this case, you're actually not even doing that. And what if the revenue goes to zero? Well, you know, 20% of zero is zero. So you're really not out a whole lot. Do you have uh, tips or tactics or, or tricks that you could identify these types of businesses? In a, and it might just be that like you're already in the gym space and you know which gyms are struggling because you're in that network. Um, are there other ways if if you want to crack into that or crack into space, whether it's local or online or something like that, that you can find those? Yeah, well, 60% of businesses on Yelp have closed. Um, so I would start with Yelp, go through and those businesses are still on Google and on Yelp. It'll just say temporarily closed or closed permanently and start there. So start with the, the low hang, hanging fruit, do it in your specific geography so that you can actually reach out to those owners. You might have to do some homework, but usually all of those businesses are going to have a Facebook account at the very least, or they're going to have some contact information on there. And, and what I would do is I would, I would reach out to them. I mean, if you really don't want the risk of owning your own business, you could always just arbitrage between businesses that exist and ones that don't. So you could go to, let's say a local restaurant, in, you know, if you're in um, Chicago and that local restaurant, you could say, hey, there are all these other businesses going under. I think we could acquire their customers. Why don't you let me be your broker in between the two deals? I don't want to run a restaurant, but I actually want to take a revenue share off of all the invest, all of the clients that we bring into you with discount codes and um, and I'll go acquire the customer base and you pay me on this basis. So like that would be one way to acquire a revenue share of a business. And then you'd go. So if, if you have Ryan. I don't know, Ryan's Thai food in Chicago. And then, um, you know, I say Ryan's Thai food, I'm going to go to six other restaurants and try to get their, their email list. And because everything's bought online today, anyways, nobody's going into restaurants. You'll be able to track every single order that you get from these individuals with this discount code. I don't see why that wouldn't be interesting or, or work. And then if you actually want to take over the business, which is where the real money is, as opposed to the low risk short game, um, then I would just be reaching out to them individually. And instead of uh, trying to transfer their users to somebody else, try to get the email list and transfer whatever the business was to online. Um, and that I think is a really interesting play. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I love just starting with Yelp because it's very public. The data is out there of, of who is struggling and who's not. And plus, exactly. I think if you just drive around Main Street and where you live, you'll get a really good idea who's doing well and who's not just by sheer fact of like, um, you, you know, whether people can walk in, you know, whether people can actually use that service. I, I think there's like a dozen ax throwing places in Salt Lake, right. That are all kind of struggling right now. now. Do you want to get into that space? No, but you start to get an idea just by driving around and seeing what's, what's working and what's not working. Um, I know we only have a few more minutes left here, Cody. You've done a lot of different size transactions. What's the biggest difference between you see in large transactions and the smaller ones, say in the you know one to two million range that um, you've also seen too? Is there a big difference between those? Or are they relatively the same? Um, you know, it usually gets to complexity. So the bigger you are, the higher multiples you pay, obviously. So they're more expensive the bigger you go. Um, the second thing is you have more competition, which leads to the higher expense. So you have to be a lot faster and you have to be a lot more competent the bigger that you go. Um, and so, and you really have to have pre-existing relationships. You need to know the, the people who you're going to get the loans from. You need to have the attorneys already lined up to work through all the docs. You need to have a real tight due diligence period. You know, you can't be doing due diligence willy-nilly kind of when you want to respond for 90 or 120 days. Um, and, uh, and so I think those are the biggest aspects. The other thing is they're, sh they're so much more complex, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But usually the term sheets are much longer. There's a lot of different um, protections that go in them. And if you try to do that, which are good in some cases, like you can have um, really complex milestones, earnouts. Um, you can have very complex, uh, you know, valuation tools um, for them. You can have massive due diligence required on multiple different aspects of the business. If you try to do all that with a small business, you're going to overwhelm the owner most likely. And so I think at the small scale. You can be a little bit looser with your timelines because there's not as much competition. You can get businesses for cheaper, but you almost have to be better at due diligence in some ways because you don't get as much uh, you don't get as much to work with. You'll get a lot less insight. 
Yeah. And a lot less, uh, like most of them have, don't have clean financials or um, they don't have the right GM in place. And so operations don't have SOPs or standard operating procedures. Um, and you know, ultimately not necessarily going big is the right thing for everybody to Cody. And some people, they should just go smaller and they're more comfortable with that. I always say, Hey, what allows you to sleep well at night? That's probably the area you should stick with. You know, maybe you lose a night or two, but you know, if you're losing three months worth of sleep, the, the, the deal is probably too big for you. Um, yep. it's been super, super helpful. And I, I love the, the value energy you bring. Um, you're working on a lot of things. Where can people find you, follow you? Where can they get your newsletter? We'll link to all that, but, uh, Let's hear it from you. Where, where can people find you? Yeah, I think the most interesting thing I'm doing right now is contrarian thinking at sub, uh, contrarian thinking .substack.com. That's my newsletter. And we're actually launching right now something called Contrarian Cashflow, which is going to be a monthly um, premium newsletter in depth with a, a Q&A that we're going to do with people who go really deep into the ideas that I have. So if you actually want a playbook on how to buy land by national parks for 10K and profit 1500, or if you want to go deep into how to turn a course business into a million dollars with a play-by-play -play for somebody who's done it, then I think this is a really interesting way to, to, to participate because it's a very cheap monthly rate. And every single month, you're going to have a new idea on something to go deep into to diversify your income stream. So check that out. I love that. Is that, can people find more about that at contrarianthinking.substack.com? And yes, sir. as a plug for you in your newsletter, for people who don't know, um, you launched this newsletter this year within, in, you know, at, at, I don't know exactly at what point, but within three months, you had over $50,000 in revenue from your newsletter. So uh, listen to Cody, follow Cody, everything she's doing on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and the newsletter. It's a great place to, to reach out to you. Cody, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me.